So today you're going to hear a very nice story that ELG out of the UK, ELG Carbon Fiber, is going to present today. Uh, you're going to hear about uh, recycling. And the person doing that is Miss Camille Surratt. And she is the technical services engineer at ELG. Uh, she's got a master's in engineering uh, in text, technical textiles and advanced materials from one of the top schools in France and, and see it. Uh, it's a national university with the School of Arts in Textiles in France, a well-known school. Uh, she also worked for Adidas. Now, one of her jobs at Adidas, she was working with recycled and natural fibers. That's interesting. A special project with the University of Durban in South Africa. So she's been to a number of places. She's currently with uh, ELG, Carbon Fiber. Today, she's going to discuss her work on uh, recycled carbon fibers into sustainable solutions for high volume manufacturing. A very interesting program and an expansion of the lead article that was uh, in the March, April issue of the Sampy Journal. Uh, the Sampy Journal program is now taking the lead articles and uh, converting those into weather and letting the authors tell about their story in much more detail. I believe the first portion, she's gonna provide you an excellent overview of the recycled carbon fiber market opportunities and applications, something you may not know. And also the second portion, she gets into a case study. Now in that one, she'll get into the actual manufacturing of recycled carbon fiber for railway bogies. I'll let her explain what a bogey is because in the US, a bogey is a little different than what she's gonna talk to for the railway. And I'll let you do that. And would like to do that. I'm uh, going to turn the presentation over to uh, Ms. Sarah. All yours. Thank you, St Scott, for the introduction. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Camille. And uh, as Scott just introduced, I work as a technical services engineer for ELG Carbon Fiber. I've been doing so for the last uh, four years. And today my presentation will focus on recycled carbon fiber and trying to show you how they are um, a solution for uh, high volume manufacturing. So the content of my presentation, I will have uh, quite a large uh, introduction on the situation of the um, recycled carbon fiber and supply chain. And then uh, I will introduce the recycling process uh, that we developed at ELG. I will go into detail of uh, a project I've been uh, quite involved with uh, in the last few years uh, in the railway industry. And I will briefly mention a few other uh, examples of application where uh, recycled carbon fiber have been uh, successfully used. And then I will just summarize uh, what we've all said. So um, the carbon fiber industry is currently facing three main challenges. Uh, the first one is on the supply chain uh, because there are some risks at the moment that the demand uh, will outstrip the supply. The second, the second uh, challenge is regarding the sustainability because as um, most of you probably know, um, it is really energy intensive to produce virgin carbon fiber. And also on the other side, uh, once uh, you've used the carbon fiber, uh, you've got to dispose of it. And uh, the landfilling is very expensive, but there are also more and more uh, restriction and regulation on how to do that. Finally, uh, the last challenge is about the cost uh, because virgin carbon fiber can be very expensive. So to, um, to overcome these challenges, um, ELG was created uh, in 2011. Uh, we are based in the UK and uh, we are an industrial leader in recycling carbon fiber. Our current capacity of recycling is around 2,000 uh, metric tons per year. And uh, with, 
from the last um, few years, uh, we managed to work uh, on developing uh, a process and uh, through that, uh, we managed to overcome uh, the three challenges I mentioned above uh, because we are able to offer a solution to a potential shortfall of carbon fiber at reduced cost. And uh, this solution is also uh, environmental friendly. So all of that is proving that recycled carbon fibers are a sustainable solution for high volume manufacturing. But I'm going to go a bit more into detail uh, in the next few slides. So again, looking at the, the title um, that I gave to my presentation, which is Recycled Carbon Fibers, a Sustainable Solution for High Volume Manufacturing. Um, if you look at the definition of sustainable in a dictionary, you can have two different definitions. Um, the first one is able to continue over a long period of time. So in our case uh, with material, if we want a sustainable material, it means we need a strong and stable supply chain where we'll be able to uh, meet all the demand and this uh, without any discontinuity. The second definition uh, is about causing little or no damage at all to the environment. So when we relate this to our material, uh, it can mean that the material has to be eco-friendly or bio-based, renewable, uh, recycling or recycled. And obviously it does involve also um, sustainable processes uh, where we would be uh, emitting uh, less and using some recovered energy. So I will show you in the, during the presentation how this um, recycled carbon fiber can fit into the two definition. Then the second part of the title is about high volume manufacturing, which is the uh, mass production. So um, I will show you how um, the recycled carbon fiber uh, can be part of high volume manufacturing because it's able to um, fabricate large quantity of goods uh, in short period of time, but also uh, with no variation. So meaning it can be uh, repeated over time. This kind of high volume manufacturing is mainly seen uh, in industries such as uh, automotive, electronics, and that's some of the main uh, industries we are working on working with at the moment. So looking a bit more into detail with the forecast uh, regarding the carbon fiber. So carbon fiber demand is actually expected to grow uh, from 123 uh, kiloton last year to 192 kilotons uh, in the next five year around 2025. Um, last year, around 85 kilotons uh, were used for industrial application, which is around 70% of the demand. And this industrial application are now forecasted to uh, grow, and they will account for almost 85% uh, of the demand growth between 2020 and 2025. It is also foreseen that the demand uh, for carbon fiber uh, will grow at a CAGR of 8% until uh, 2030, so in the next 10 years. However, uh, from all this uh, carbon fiber demand, uh, up to 30% of the carbon fiber uh, will be actually wasted during the manufacturing phase. So it means during production, during the operation of cutting or trimming, we're gonna waste uh, this material that could result in over uh, 50 kilotons of material to be disposed of, although this material would still be of very good value. In addition, um, we'll have more and more waste uh, generated uh, because of airplanes such as Boeing 777 or Airbus A320, uh, which are going to reach the end of their life and uh, this kind of airplanes are really uh, using lots of composite and up to 20% of carbon fiber. 
another uh, point to take into account uh, into this presentation and the supply chain stability uh, is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disrupted and had impacted the composite industry and also the carbon fiber supply chain. So manufacturers had to reduce the number of line, meaning that uh, the total um, output of carbon fiber has been reduced. It's been expected that uh, for the next two years, uh, we'll, be, we'll still have some surplus uh, with the reduced capacities, but uh, it's foreseen that uh, the virgin carbon fiber demand could be higher than the supply um, from 2024 onwards. So from that date, we could have a gap and that's where it creates more and more opportunities for the use of recycled carbon fiber. So there is no doubt at the moment that recycled carbon fiber are a sustainable solution that will be able to offer a stable source of material over a long period of time. However, looking at the current situation at the moment, there is lots of work needed uh, to build a very robust supply chain to make sure that we've got enough material uh, to recycle and um, of the right grade and type and also one very important parameter is that that feedstock needs to be fully controlled. But if you look at the current situation, uh, these are data from 2018, uh, less than 1% of carbon fiber is currently being recycled. So it is a very, very low number compared to other materials such as steel or aluminum where 86 or 70% uh, of the material are being uh, recycled. So at the moment in the composite industry, uh, it's not using enough recycled material uh, to satisfy the demand and we still don't have a robust uh, infrastructure to do so. Now more looking onto the uh, environmental side, uh, if you look at the embodied energy uh, of the structural materials, um, recycled carbon fiber uh, have a very, very low uh, embodied energy compared uh, to many other materials and especially compared uh, to carbon, to virgin carbon fiber. So it means that uh, it's usually uh, a very uh, good benefic benefit for uh, the environment to, to recycle and use recycled carbon fiber. So after this uh, very long introduction, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, what ELG has been doing in the last few years and what's the solution that has been developed uh, to recycle uh, carbon fiber and try to overcome the three challenges that I mentioned before. So that, that was a, a process fully developed in order to close the loop of uh, recycled carbon fiber. So this patented uh, reclaiming process uh, is developed at indu industrial scale. So we are currently able to process over 2000 metric ton of carbon fiber each year. The way it's working, uh, starting from the feedstock, so we are able to work with three different kinds of feedstock. We've got the dry feedstock, the pre prep feedstock, and the laminate feedstock. So the dry feedstock can be composed of uh, bobins or toens. It can be material coming directly from carbon fiber supplier, but material that has been produced out of specification or is not uh, cannot be used or sold uh, to customer, but it can also be um, waste or uh, left bobbin from other industries such as uh, weaving industry. And finally, the dry material can also be coming from dry fabrics or dry uh, NCF offcuts that are being used during the manufacturing process. The second uh, type of feedstock is the prepreg, uh, so the uncured prepreg uh, that, that are mainly coming into the shape of offcuts, offcuts from the manufacturing um, process uh, that, that cannot um, 
that are being cut. Uh, but it can also be sometimes some uh, full rolls of prepreg that have been uh, over their expiry date uh, and therefore uh, they are not good uh, for use anymore. The last uh, type of feedstock we can receive uh, are the cured laminates. Uh, so the, the proper composite uh, material that is being coming uh, mainly at the moment from uh, the manufacturing uh, operation, as I mentioned before, but that will be coming uh, probably more and more in the future from uh, end of life waste. Moving into the process, once we've collected uh, this material uh, into our, uh, our warehouses, uh, the first step mainly for the prepreg and laminates uh, is shredding. So that's uh, with this step, we can uh, mechanically break down uh, into smaller pieces um, the, the waste, and then it's easier uh, for the other uh, step of the process. So once the material has been shredded, it's then being paralyzed uh, through the patented uh, paralysis process. Um, so that's really the heart of the recycling process because we are uh, degrading, burning off uh, the resin, the matrix. And uh, after this step, uh, we only get uh, the clean recovered carbon fiber. Then uh, it's, being, it's being chopped a different length, and we, we end up with an intermediate product, which is a stable carbon fiber, as you can see on the picture. Um, so what did ELG do to have a stable supply chain? So over the last few years, uh, we've secured some long-term contract uh, with aerospace company. Uh, so it means that uh, we are ready to answer the growing demand and obviously we are ready to fill the supply and demand gap. Also, since we are working with um, aerospace company, uh, the material are coming from a long-term program. So it means that uh, there is some consistency in the waste material that we are getting and it's a really good uh, material grade. So at the moment in our uh, Warehouses, we've got uh, lots of waste already collected and available for recycling, but it's also foreseen that uh, these quantities will grow in the coming years. Now moving into the environmental benefits of using recycled carbon fiber. So um, it's very uh, well known that the majority of the energy consumption uh, is coming from the virgin carbon fiber production. Uh, here at ELG, our recycling process uses about 10% of the energy needed uh, to produce virgin carbon fiber. So that's a great um, positive point for recycling carbon fiber because then uh, the total life cycle analysis uh, is having some really good positive impact. So if you look at the graph below, uh, the, uh, the emission uh, produced during the, um, recycle, during the manufacture of recycled carbon fiber is still higher than the production of steel, but a lot lower than the emission produced uh, by the production of virgin carbon fiber. And then over the time during the use phase, the recycled carbon fiber um, is uh, becoming uh, a lot more um, is becoming a lot more easier to um, it does have a lower embodied energy uh, compared to um, the virgin carbon fiber and even uh, to the steel uh, material. So the low embodied energy of the recycled carbon fiber is creating uh, immediate LCA benefits over metals, especially in the use phase. So our, our solution is to supply a recycled carbon fiber. 
So this recycled carbon fiber uh, are mainly from paralyzed uncured preprog and cured laminate. They've got similar properties to the virgin carbon fiber, but they are not exactly the same as virgin car carbon fiber because they are very different physically. Uh, they will be mainly in the shape of individual filaments or irregular bundle of individual filament that are quite fluffy and very lightweight with a shorter length because it's typically uh, 15 to 150 millimeters. And then uh, we can solve the fiber by length. Uh, the shorter fiber can be used for compounding and the longer fiber can be used for non woven mat production that I will detail uh, a bit later. Uh, but in any case, the recycled carbon fiber uh, will provide the same weight benefits as using virgin carbon fiber, but at a lower economic and environmental cost. Here is just a quick um, overview of the mechanical properties comparing the virgin fiber properties and the post paralysis uh, properties of intermediate and standard modulus. As you can see, we've got a very good retention of the mechanical properties after uh, paralysis uh, because the tensile modulus and strength are between um, 93 and 96%. However, um, although they have the same mechanical properties, uh, it might be a bit more difficult um, to achieve the same degree of alignment and fiber uh, volume fraction compared to virgin carbon fiber. So once the material has been recycled, ELG has been working in the last few years to develop a, a recycled product range uh, that I'm going to detail here. So it's going from very short uh, length to longer length. So it's all branded under the Carbizo brand. So the first one in the car is the Carbizo MF for milk fiber. Uh, we've got two standard products which are uh, Carbizo MF at 80 microns and 100 microns. Uh, so it's like a carbon fiber powder that can be used for coatings and compounds. Then uh, if we go a bit longer, we've got a uh, chop product, which are the Carbizo C and Carbizo CT. So Carbizo C is gonna be a random chop. So you will have uh, wider tolerances, for example, 10 to 30 millimeters or 30 to 60 millimeter. When the Carbizo CT is a precision chopped, so our two standard products are six millimeter and 12 millimeter and you've got very tight uh, tolerances, which are usually plus or minus one millimeter. Then uh, if we go longer into uh, with our fiber, so around 80 millimeter long, uh, we can use them and produce some non-woven mat, non mat. So we've got two types of uh, non-woven. Uh, first one is the Carbizo TM, which is a hybrid non-woven. So it means that the carbon fiber are mixed uh, with dry thermoplastic fiber, such as PP, PA, PPS. And then uh, this hybrid non-woven can be used for special processes that we will de um, detail uh, in the next slides. The second type of non-woven is the Carbizo M, which is a 100% carbon fiber so um, it's really only carbon fiber and can be used for uh, these uh, various um, manufacturing processes. So just a quick summary of the product and where they can be used. So the milled fiber can mainly be used for injection molding, same as for the chopped fiber, uh, but they can also uh, be used for thermoplastic over molding. The 100% carbon fiber non-woven mat can be used for vacuum infusion, RTM, but also pre-preg out of autoclave uh, compression molding. And finally, the hybrid non-woven mat Carbizo TM can be used for thermoplastic over molding or compression molding. It can also be used uh, to prepare some organo sheets. So now that I have detailed 
what ELG is doing and our different product. I'm going to show you um, a proper example, which is a project I've been working on for the last few years. Uh, this is in the railway industry. So we all know that composites are an efficient solution in transportation because it can reduce the weight and therefore it will reduce the fuel consumption and the maintenance cost. This is mainly used at the moment in industries such as aerospace or automotive, but not so much in the railway industry, which is a bit more conservative and uh, still tends to prefer using materials such as metals over uh, composites. But they are becoming more and more important uh, in the railway industry, actually, and especially they can be good uh, in rolling stock application. A train bogey or a train truck uh, is a typical example here because it's representative of the technical challenges uh, due to the high requirements encountered as being a structural application, but that's where the use of composite could have some large benefits. So this project has been an uh, ongoing project funded by uh, the Rail Safety and Standard Boards in the UK, and it did involve some um, industrial and academic partners, uh, all of the partners had a specific role, so ELG for the raw materials, Magma Structure has been in charge of the design and manufacture. And then we had two universities in the UK uh, that worked on condition monitoring and full-scale testing. Uh, we had also some important subcontractor for the FEA and the fatigue testing. So an introduction to the project, um, we had some uh, quite interesting challenges because we wanted to demonstrate an optimized lightweight rail buggy frame um, using recycled carbon fiber. And we wanted this buggy frame to be fully compliant with all the railway standards, meaning it had to meet all the mechanical, fire and fatigue requirements. But overall, we wanted to convey the railway industry um, that uh, it was possible to use composite uh, in that kind of structures. So at the beginning of the project, we defined some objective that we wanted to achieve. The first one was to reduce the frame weight by 50%, as well as the transverse loading by 40%. We wanted to add some features to this uh, frame by providing through life condition monitoring. Obviously, the, ob the main uh, objective was to develop and test uh, the full scale prototype in order to demonstrate that uh, it could work technically. And finally, uh, I wanted to show that uh, it would be a product that would be commerci commercially viable. We've decided to use uh, recycled carbon fiber first for uh, its lower cost, uh, but also, um, for example, compared to glass, uh, it has a higher stiffness and it does have some ad advantages uh, in being used for manufacturing six sessions. So the overall benefits foreseen in having a composite buggy frame would be to reduce the track wear uh, since we have a lower weight and then also reduce uh, again the track wear uh, because we would have a better flexibility. And finally, uh, we wanted lower operating cost uh, since we've got lower weight and reduced energy consumption. So first challenges was on the design. Um, so we selected uh, one specific uh, design uh, based on, on Alstom class 180. The reason why we chose this one is because um, that was quite a classic uh, design for bogies. So it was well known, the performances were well understood. And also, uh, since it was already existing, we had already supply of spare parts uh, that we could be using uh, for the different part of the testing. Um, but it did create some compromises in the design. Uh, we had to use the same fittings and equipment and put them in the same uh, geometric position. Um, 
so yeah we had to compromise on the shape and on how to incorporate uh, all this fitting and equipment so the design at the moment is probably not uh, optimal and you can see this design here so it's basically a, a composite shell that is then uh, completed with a unidirectional reinforcement uh, on the side beams. The second challenge was about introducing composite material, uh, as I briefly mentioned before, because we had concern regarding the fire, fatigue, and mechanical performance. So characterizing all of that uh, was a really critical project task. Uh, we didn't have much guidance because at the moment all the regulation and standards in the railway industry are written for the use of me metallic materials. Again, another challenge is that uh, in the railway industry, composites are mainly seen as um, material for interiors and not uh, for uh, structural parts. Finally, the last um, concern uh, regarding composite material uh, was the cost. So how did we construct and manufacture our bogey? Um, it was made from a carbon composite shell, so we actually bonded together a top and bottom uh, shell. Uh, so the construction incorporates some recycler, recycled non-woven carbon fiber, um, as you can see on the picture on the left. So we try to use it as much as possible to reduce the cost, but we also had to use some virgin uh, unidirectional carbon fiber, uh, especially on the side beam where we needed more uh, strength and st stiffness. This uh, non-woven mat has then been uh, prepared uh, into a pre-preg. Uh, we used an epoxy resin because uh, we know well the mechanical properties and we know it's a durable resin. Uh, this epoxy resin was also fire retardant in order to make sure that uh, we would be meeting the fire performances. So this epoxy prepreg was, was cured in the autoclave. Uh, regarding the unidirectional reinforcement, uh, it was automated uh, layup, as you can see in the picture in the middle. And uh, we also added some uh, optics train gauges sensor uh, on this frame to allow um, the, the monitoring. So the picture on the right is showing a part of the bogey shell. Uh, so it's missing one part so that you can see that it's uh, actually, it's really a shell, it's hollow in the middle. And the weight, uh, so regarding the manufacturer, we had uh, tools uh, which were actually one quarter um, of the bogey because um, the left and right are symmetrical so you, we used uh, only one tool to do the two uh, top and one tool to do the two bottoms um, part and since it was creating smaller parts uh, it was easier for the cure in the autoclave um, so just a quick comparison, obviously uh, using composites uh, is lighter uh, because uh, it has a, a lower density compared to, to a typical steel. The tensile strength is okay, meeting the strength requirement, but uh, we've got a modulus which is lower than the typical steel. So that's why we had to use um, unidirectional virgin carbon fiber to provide the correct stiffness uh, to the bogey frame. So before choosing the uh, epoxy uh, pre-preg uh, solution, we actually uh, also um, looked at different manufacturing ways, uh, including re resin infusion of dry fabrics. But in the end, uh, we moved to the autoclave molding of pre-preg. Once this choice uh, was made, we started making some flat panel coupons uh, that we tested in static and dynamic. Uh, we also did some impact resistant tests um, on the uh, using like a drop weight. We did some fatigue testing of this laminate scoopant and it showed to be a similar results to conventional woven carbon fiber and the fatigue was better over time than the structural steel. 
we had to pass the fire testing. Um, so HL2 rating was required for the bogey. We achieved HL3, which is the highest and most difficult um, level to achieve. We also did some uh, environmental and chemical exposure uh, testing of the laminates. Regarding the condition monitoring, uh, we've added a 36 sensor to the bogey frame. So they were installed inside the bogey shell uh, before all being bonded. So as you can see uh, in the middle picture, there was uh, lots of wiring and uh, routing inside the shell. And we had detailed uh, CAD and drawings of how we wanted to route it. And also there was uh, a software that was created by the University of uh, Birmingham, where they've got uh, in real time the reading for each sensor at their location. So here it's an example of the kind of data that has been collected during testing. So we've got some uh, real time output on two sensors um, that can be um, yeah, looked at in real time. Finally, the last uh, part of the, um, of the project was the full scale test program once the buggy was fully manufactured. So we followed some international standard uh, as for the steel buggy frame. Uh, we had a test string uh, of 50 tons and we replicated a static and fatigue loading test uh, just to make sure that we are in uh, agreement with what has been calculated in the FEA we want to prove um, the results and we want to make sure that uh, the monitoring system uh, is working properly. Once we've got all this data gathered, uh, we'll do a full analysis of the testing results. So as I quickly mentioned, it's all been planned, designed, implemented according to some specific standard for all the different uh, load cases. So here are uh, table load cases from the standards. And that's, what, uh, that's exactly what has been uh, put into the test string. Here you've got some schematics of the, the bogey frame on the test string. So it did involve lots of uh, hydraulic actuators to replicate all the vertical lateral and um, longitudinal load cases. We aim to achieve 10 million cycle without any failure and all fixtures have been approved and designed uh, to reach uh, these 10 million cycles. We also had some intermittent monitoring of the fixture fixing and all the temperature all around the buggy. So that's now some real picture of how the buggy is being set up on the test rig and uh, how it's being monitorized with videos and cameras. Last point on the presentation uh, on the economic and environmental benefits. Um, so this is using some data based in the UK. So it's all in pounds. Um, Assuming a weight saving of 590 kilos per bogey frame, uh, they would be uh, delivering a value between 7.5 thousand uh, pound or 62 thousand pounds. So depending if you're looking at high speed or metro, um, you can have some different saving value. But it does show that carbon fiber bogey frames will be economically viable uh, for all these kind of uh, service. So it can clearly um, widen the range of application where composite can compete on a cost weight basis. On the environmental side, we did some analysis and uh, we did calculate that each bogey light, each lightweight bogey frame could save up to 60 tons of CO2 emissions for its lifetime. So a bogey lifetime is typically typically 35 years. Um, so the embedded COD in each bogey frame um, that is due to the use of carbon fiber in manufacture is around 0.3 tons. So that's less than um, the embodied CO2 uh, in any other lightweight material. 
So progress up to date on this project, which is almost completed, uh, should be done in a couple of months. We fully manufactured our bogey uh, with all the sensor inside and all the fittings have been attached. The total weight is 715 kilos, um, including the steel fittings that are being represented here uh, with the red uh, parts. Um, so it, it, it does add a bit of weight, but um, we still achieved the 50% weight savings that we were aiming for. Uh, all the steel brackets that we've been using from a previous um, steel bogey um, have been added to the composite bogey and uh, are able to uh, interface uh, well with our bogey. We did pass the fire and fatigue performances. Um, we've done all the static testing at full scale. Uh, it was successful, the buggy didn't uh, break. And at the moment, the fatigue testing is still ongoing. We are between five and six million cycles, so a bit over 50% since we are hoping for uh, 10 million cycles. But at this stage, there is no, um, no issues. Uh, we haven't detected uh, anything uh, on, the, on the buggy frame. So the next step are uh, finalizing this uh, testing and reviewing all the data. And then we would like to have a follow on project to maybe develop a uh, manufacture more bogey and have it uh, properly tested on a track where then we could go for full qualification validation and uh, then maybe at some point have a commercial application and adoption. So in conclusion on this project, uh, the composite can deliver significant weight saving, economic and environmental benefits to the railway industry. Using recycled carbon fiber can even, can contribute even more uh, to the economic and environmental business, ca business case. All the concerns regarding mechanical fire fatigue performances have been addressed. And we are waiting for the results of the full scale testing to completely validate the, con the design concept, modeling methods, and condition monitoring system. Just quickly, some other uh, high volume uh, application. So for example, here, an automotive application as a structural panel. So we are able to achieve a class A surface finish. This is made from the 100% carbon fiber non-woven mat uh, with uh, an epoxy resin used as a pre-preg uh, in high volume compression molding. So this product is already in, in series production at a European OEM. Second example of high volume application is in the uh, electronic application uh, such as laptop cases. So we can replace glass fiber core uh, with the recycled carbon fiber and it results in um, the laptop case being 20% lighter and 50% stiffer. It also reduces quite a lot uh, the greenhouse gases emission and the volume uh, reach every year uh, can be very high. So in summary, why should we use more recycled carbon fiber? Uh, we now have a proven industrial scale uh, way of recycling uh, any waste of carbon fiber. And those recovered um, carbon fiber still have some very good mechanical properties. Uh, we've been able to develop some product, a large range uh, of product suitable for use in most uh, composite or component uh, industry and manufacturing processes. This including uh, new process and high volume production. Using recycled carbon fiber can obviously reduce the cost and environmental impact uh, of carbon composite structures. It does help addressing the potential imbalance between the demand and supply as we talked earlier in the presentation. And it still retains the same weight potential as virgin carbon fiber in many applications. 
So thank you for listening. That's uh, that's it for me today. And I hope I did uh, convince you that uh, recycled carbon fiber should be more um, used in many, many applications in the future. Well, thank you, Camille. Uh, if you can give me the screen back again, yes. we'll stop share sharing the screen. And uh, we got uh, a fair number of questions. We had a, a good audience here. Let me answer the uh, the first question that was was asked. Uh, the presentations, uh, slides, and the recording will be provided to those who register. So that gets that out of the way. Uh, the other aspect is let's go into some of the questions. Uh, the first question came from Boeing. Does pyrolysis process work with both thermosets and thermoplastics? Um, at the moment. That's the Sorry. At, at the moment, we, we only focus on uh, thermoset-based um, composites. OK. Do you see that that would be a problem, though, if you were to uh, be working on thermoplastics? Do you think you could uh, uh, recycle those uh, as easily? I, I guess because we all know that thermoplastic can also be um, recycled but um i assume it would be kind of a different process because uh the 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 thermoplastic would be uh, melting back in its form so I'd, i i assume that at very high temperature we we should be able to to use the paralysis again but um i think that for thermoplastic uh recycle for recycling thermoplastic composite they may have some better um, solution than paralysis. OK, thank you. Uh, this next one is probably more of a comment. Uh, maybe you want to uh, address that one. Uh, all this discussion is burning off the resin. Of course, you're working with the thermosets. Uh, the viewer uh, views that as not quite contributable to sustainable recycling. Any comments on that? I think I think he feels maybe that's uh, that's going against the terminology a bit. Yeah, no, I mean, at, at the moment, I think the we've got a good process, um, which is uh, obviously using less energy than uh, the production of virgin carbon fiber. But um, we are not we don't have a process to reuse uh, properly the the material or the emission that are being burned off. Um, so it's just um, at the moment with our paralysis process, we've got um, a way to um, clean uh, the emission uh, and um, release the emission properly uh, in, in the atmosphere, but we don't have a way to re reuse the, the oil or anything that is being uh, produced during the paralysis process. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, have you tried to recover continuous fiber? And if so, what are the challenges with continuous as opposed to say chopped up fiber? Um, so sometimes we try to uh, recycle some uh, very large parts. So we can end up with having a quite long um, carbon fiber uh, being recovered, but um, since we are not working uh, with that uh, kind of uh, long fiber, it always uh, end up being chopped on our side. Okay. Uh, this next one may be a comment on the, uh, the, other, the question that popped up, because I think everybody sees the question. When parts are cut up, for example, prepreg and uh, non-crimp fiber, they're not actually continuous. Uh, it's easier to chop it. So continuous fiber may still be a bit fuzzy. Is that, uh, is that your feeling that even if you uh, use continuous fiber, it may be still fuzzy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. OK. Uh, here's an interesting question. Can these fibers that you you are working with at ELG, can they be pleated or folded as a as a mat material? 
Yeah, yeah. So that's the one of the advantages of the non-woven non mat that we produce uh, is that uh, it's got a, a very good uh, droppability. So it's very easy to fold and to uh, adapt uh, to complex shapes. I guess the other obvious uh, question to that is, okay, so they can be pleated or folded. Uh, to what extent can you uh, really fold as far as an angle or do you get a stress concentration factor by doing that? Any comment I, I on that? Yeah, it really depends on the complexity and the angle. Um, but it's, it's usually doing pretty well uh, in terms of droppability and uh, avoiding that kind of um, issues in the corner. But you, you, you will still have a, a little bit of, of stress if it's a, if it's a really complex or weird, weird shape. Okay. So let me, let me ask you another question that seems to come up. Are there software capabilities that would handle these types of materials since they're not quite your traditional uh, non crimp or fabric or textile or continuous fibers are you, are there challenges in the uh, software industry in handling these things to anal analyze them yes so um that that was a bit complicated when we did the uh, final element analysis because we, we use some data that we generated during the uh, laminate phase um, to, uh, yeah, we, we use this data in the, in the software, but there is always some question about is the material isotropic and isotropic, it's short fiber. So it's not always easy uh, with the software at the moment to properly replicate uh, what the non-woven, uh, the random chopped, uh, non-woven uh, is or how it's actually behaving. I mean, we, we can approach it close, but we still need some uh, safety factor uh, to take into account to to make sure uh, we we are planning a bit in advance to to in case we've got some issues. Okay. This next question, uh, it, it talks about ITAR restrictions, but I believe it really uh, is meaning to talk about uh, EAR, the Export uh, Administration Regulations. That is, what, what criteria or restrictions are there for shipping these types of recycled materials back and forth now to various countries since the EAR normally uh, establishes the restrictions based on the the unrecycled fibers. Um, I guess, that, I guess I'm asking, are there, are there now restrictions on recycled fibers as there are for unrecycled fibers, which are typically specific strength and specific, specific modulus? What do you know um, about that? Anything? That's not really my area of expertise, but I, I don't think there are any issues that I am aware of in terms of shipping seems to be similar to, to other material. But okay, I, it's been a while since I've worked in that area. I think there, there have been some movement in that area, but I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's firmly uh, uh, resolved yet. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's another one that came in the, the question box. Uh, are different sizings uh, on carbon fiber retained when you do the recycling, that is, you do the recycling, are the sizing still there or do you have to start over again? No, so um, when we when we paralyze the material, we remove all sizing or all resin. So the fiber post post paralysis, um, it's fully, fully clean. It doesn't have any resin left. So that's why it's very different physically because it's very fluffy. And we don't add anything less, anything else on top of that. Okay, I think this next question has already been answered. Can you recycle carbon fiber from thermoset materials? And I believe you've, you've yeah, already that, said yes. Yeah, that's our main feedstock. We focus on thermoset. Right. Now here's one relative to design challenges. What design challenges did you face 
when using a recycled carbon fiber versus uh, uh, traditional carbon fiber, unrecycled. I think the, the, the main one we, we had to face is, as I had already highlighted in the presentation, is the fact that we, we still had to use some uh, virgin unidirectional carbon fiber to uh, properly meet all the requirements because using non-woven mat, uh, we've got shorter fiber oriented in many different directions. So it's kind of impossible to meet the, the requirement without using um, some uni unidirectional fiber. So we had to find the right balance uh, between the recycle and the, the unidirectional and how many layers of each uh, we wanted to use to have the optimal um, design balance and also cost balance. This, uh, that question also uh, raises some other concerns. For example, uh, you have a recycled fiber now that may be similar to the original fiber, but you're going to put it in a different resin. So trying to find a database that has been established and is in the literature is, is probably next to impossible. So what I'm guessing is you have to have a test program to now go out and establish new properties because they don't exist. Is that, uh, is that your feeling? That looks like what you did for the bogey. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are still early in the recycling, but obviously when you come to material data card or even technical data sheets, uh, we, we, we are still early, we are, yeah, for every new polymers, every new resin, we've got to uh, do some batch analysis, uh, doing a certain number of tests uh, before being confident in the data uh, and in what our material can, uh, can actually offer. Right. I had a question on fatigue cycles. How far out do you have to go to develop reasonable fatigue data for a rail bogey because I know typically for aircraft, you're talking 10 to the six cycles, maybe wind blades 10 to the seven, maybe something even higher. How many cycles do you have to go to establish uh, that those curves for the, uh, the fatigue data? Uh, we've got to go 10 millions. So that's 10 to six. Uh, it'd be 10 to the seven. Okay. <laughs> because 10 to the six, 10 to six is uh, is a million, so you got uh, ten to the seven. Yeah, so you're yeah. you're kind of like wind blades, basically. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Got one more here, and then there's some more that popped in. So let me see if I can get this one. Are the recycled carbon fibers sized or resized? No. You put sizing no. back on them again. No, we don't. It's unsized, don't. Okay. fully unsized. So this is why it makes it very fluffy and even more lightweight uh, than traditional size carbon fiber. Okay. Uh, let me go into the uh, the records here and see what else has popped up because there's some other ones that have popped up. Okay. Um, this one uh, looks like it comes from U University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, due to inherent variation in recycled fiber formats, local fiber orientation and matrix rich regions. What was the design of allowables for static and fatigue behavior? And how do you assure meeting the material strength and modulus since you have uh, a lot of variation in feedstock? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So that's, that's um, a very important topic for, for recycling carbon fiber because obviously when it's coming to us it's waste uh, but first when when it's arriving at ELG we've got kind of a very uh, strict way of uh, identifying and segregating our material so there are, um, every material that we receive is segregated by supplier also, we don't mix uh, standard modulus and uh, intermediate modulus fiber. Um, so we try to, to keep the fiber with a similar um, properties together. And so that uh, in that way, we can limit uh, the variability and variations uh, in our final product. 
but okay. that, that's a good point that uh, there is an intrinsic uh, variability uh, to the waste. I've got a question. Uh, this one goes to Brianna. Brianna, uh, looks like we've got a number of questions that have popped up here on your list. <laughs> additional ones that I haven't covered yet. Uh, what is the timing sequence uh, for for finishing off the uh, webinar? We're going over time a little bit here. Hey, Scott. Yeah, there's one more I popped to you in the chat and then uh, we can conclude the session just to be respectful of everyone's time. Okay. I can, and... Maybe if I can get the question, I can answer them separately. Absolutely, yeah. We'll follow up with you and uh, the attendees offline. Thanks, Camille. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that question you're referring to is either in the chat box or the Q&A, which one? Um, I popped it to you in the chat. Okay, let me see if I can find it here. Ah, okay. So last question for the time being, does the energy of combustion from the resin contribute to the energy required for the recovery process for incineration of off gas? Um, Do I need to read? You want me to read it back, or are you okay? <laughs> um, I'm just gonna make sure I properly understand it, um, because. Let me let me read it back, and you can be thinking about it. Does yeah. the energy of combustion from the resin contribute to the energy required for the recovery process um, for like incineration of off the, gas? Are we reusing the the energy to? To recover I'm the. Sorry. I'm not. I'm not catching that. Um, so Do I, need I to read think it back? I would say that uh, we we don't reuse uh, the energy uh, generated from the combustion of the resin. Okay, so it doesn't feed back in there. No, no, it doesn't. Okay. And you'll you'll have uh, Camille will have these uh, these questions. So if she wants to uh, look back through them and uh, comment on them again, uh, she can. Hey uh, Scott. Hey, yes. I just wanted to chime in for Camille and um, all the attendees that are still with us. Um, when we send out the presentation slides, feel free to contact Camille directly. Um, we'll do our best at Sampi to facilitate the asked questions, but for sure we can continue those conversations. So. Um, Mail has been nice enough to give her email out. So please do feel free to reach out. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to, uh, at this point, as we conclude, really thank uh, Camille. That was an excellent presentation. A lot of uh, facts and a lot of things you've covered there. And uh, we just generated a lot of questions and a lot of interest. So again, thanks to the audience, as well as to Camille. So thank you very much. And we will have another uh, webinar in, uh, I believe, June and that will be on a wind energy uh, project. Thank you, Camille, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, take care, we'll talk soon. Au revoir. Thank you, Scott, bye-bye.